workers, fearful every day. I have three surviving sons who live with trauma. Violence sparked by guns hitting communities hard. We view this as a health care issue. It's the leading cause of death in kids. Go a minute. Go. Now, a CBS2 investigation reveals the root causes of gun crime. I feel obligated to uphold the reputation. I feel obligated to um, uphold the persona, the persona that I built to fit in. We're on the streets with the people working to find solutions. It can happen. It can be stopped. It's going to take some time, though. And break the cycle. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Maurice Dubois. And I'm Christine Johnson. Gun violence is something we hear, see, and talk about every day. Over the next half hour, a CBS2 investigation reveals what's really behind it, how the guns make it to our area, how they're used, and how it directly impacts all areas of our community. But we're also searching for solutions. A recent Siena College poll showed 76% of New Yorkers are concerned they will become a victim of a violent crime. What is causing this concern and what can be done to make our city safer. Tonight, we take a deep dive into the gun violence epidemic and identify ways to fight the problem. We want to begin with how we got here. New data uncovered by CBS2 revealed an alarming spike in the summer of 2020. Years earlier, the problem hit home for one man who was nearly killed by a bullet meant for someone else. He told Marsha Kramer that the person he credits for saving his life was later shot and killed himself. When Antonio Zuri Adaya walks down Nostrand Avenue, he has flashbacks. Flashbacks to that terrible day nine years ago when he was accidentally shot, when a man started shooting at a pregnant woman in front of him. I remember looking up in the sky and thinking, it's a beautiful day, but I'm going to die. Here he is in cell video, clutching his chest seconds after he was shot, and here in the hospital. They put me into a five-day coma, and when I woke up, I was the happiest person on earth, to be honest. I was also the angriest, because I knew that this would happen again. It happened in 2013, but his fears are the fears of many New Yorkers today, as gun violence has spiked, and any innocent bystander, young or old, can be caught in the crossfire. The person I think of is the person who saved my life. A barber came out of his barber shop and he ran off to where I was and he put his hand on top of my hand to prevent me from bleeding out. A year later he was shot and killed. Gun violence is an epidemic. An analysis by CBS2 shows that gun violence spiked in June and July of 2020, reaching record levels not seen since 2006, according to CBS data analyst Christopher Hacker. Yeah, it, is, it is definitely as far back as I'm able to look at data, the biggest jump by far that we've ever seen. The numbers speak for themselves. 967 people shot in 2019, 1,948 in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, 2011 in 2021. <laughs> The biggest spike in 2020 coincides with the George Floyd protests. The they fund the police movement supported by then Mayor Bill de Blasio and the right city council and anti chokehold bills passed by the state legislature in Albany that crushed the morale of the NYPD. In a sense, it was a perfect storm. The biggest mistake people make when it deals with public safety is that they don't realize bad guys read the papers also. And so when the bad guys are picking up the papers and reading all of these things that we're doing, uh, we're, some are calling for disband the police department, some are calling for not prosecuting gun crimes, the bad guys are saying to themselves, hey, here's some real opportunities here. CBS2 research based on NYPD data shows gun violence doesn't affect all parts of the city the same way. Research suggests that the neighborhoods with the most gun violence are often the poorest and most blighted. We looked at the number of shootings victims since 2015. Bedford-Stuyvesant had 349 shootings, Brownsville 333, Harlem 244, East Harlem 213. Compared with Chelsea Hudson Yards, 27 shootings, Upper West Side Lincoln Square, 14, Murray Hill Kips Bay, 11, South Williamsburg, 9. It might be a wake-up call for city officials to think that they might be able to reduce the violence by just fixing things. Yeah, by just fixing things, by improving garbage collection, by, by fixing potholes, by, by remediating abandoned buildings and removing abandoned vehicles. We have to look at the anatomy of violence. And if you look at the 30 precincts where 80% of the violence is coming from, this is what you're going to find. You're going to find a failing school system. 
you're going to find find the largest amount of undiagnosed mental health issues, undiagnosed uh, learning disabilities. You're going to even find that there are places where you didn't have a large number of vaccines. You're going to find all of the largest number of unhealthy foods, a largest number of uh, high school dropouts being locked up during the per pandemic. All of a sudden, you know, the close down was lifted. Now you're out in the street. You're going to see that violence that has been pinned up for a long time. The mayor and police officials say bail reform, releasing people charged with serious crimes, also played a role because the bad guys didn't think they would be punished. People are getting caught with weapons in New York City and they're not facing justice. They're back out on the street. So the same person, you, you see it in the paper all the time. This is the third time he has weapon possession. He just shot somebody. Why is he on the street? You have the cops and the good people of this city are all fighting against everyone else. It is as though we don't realize that there are innocent New Yorkers in this city that are doing the right thing and no one is saying and speaking on their behalf and I'm not going to do that. Mayor Adams, along with many other lawmakers, fear the recent Supreme Court ruling on guns in New York will have far-reaching implications. Dick Brennan tells us how increasing violence is only fueling concerns. This keeps me up at night. With continued gun violence shaking New York City to its core, the ruling last week from the U.S. Supreme Court ending restrictions on concealed carry permits is also troubling many lawmakers. We don't need more guns on our streets. We're already dealing with a major gun violence crisis. We don't need to add more fuel to this fire. But Justice Clarence Thomas, in writing the 6-3 to three majority opinion, states the new law of the land. New York's proper cause requirement violates the 14th Amendment in that it prevents law-abiding citizens with ordinary self-defense needs from exercising their right to keep and bear arms. This overturns a century-old state law requiring pistol permit applicants prove they face special or unique danger and had proper cause to get a carry permit. Still, officials caution, this isn't a light switch being thrown for sidearms permitted on every hip. And Adding, implementation could be a year, even two away. If you have a premise permit, it does not automatically convert to a carry permit. If you carry a gun illegally in New York City, you will be arrested. By the numbers right now, 1,700 have the right to carry when they leave home. 1,400 have permits from other counties with New York endorsements to carry in the five boroughs. And more than 16,000 have premise permits. It's not clear how many of those permits will be transferred to concealed carry under the new law. Officials are also focusing on the language in the ruling that will allow them to limit the places that people can carry guns, so-called sensitive places such as public transit, stadiums, and theaters. They're also looking at the possibility of training before a new permit is issued. Interestingly, the usual progressive legal aid society came down in favor of the new ruling, saying it embodied arbitrary licensing standards that have inhibited lawful black and brown gun ownership in New York. While others caution, the former tighter restrictions have limited at least the legal guns out on the street. The NYPD has always been quite careful about who they give permission to to carry guns, and that has really kept the number of people carrying guns lawfully way down. Here's another look at why leaders are so concerned about the Supreme Court ruling. According to the NYPD, there were 1,531 shooting incidents in 2020. That is a stunning 97% increase from 2019. Authorities often do disrupt gun trafficking schemes. Criminals buy firearms, mostly handguns, from states south of New York along the I-95 corridor. They then transport the weapons to New York markets. Here are the states that we're talking about, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. They are supplier states, and the steady stream of weapons along I-95 has led to the nickname the Iron Pipeline. Now, New York State's Attorney General's office keeps a close eye on where those likely traffic guns in come in from the city. According to a recent report, Virginia supplied 19% of New York City's likely traffic guns. Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Georgia were next on the list with 13 
15%. Those states were followed by North Carolina and Florida. As for New York, 0% of likely traffic guns in the city actually come from the state. And what's also tracked is something called time to crime. That is the time between when a gun is purchased to when law enforcement recovers it. Many people wonder why a city with some of the strictest gun laws in the country has such a problem with gun violence. A lot of it has to do with those traffic guns. As Marsha Kramer reveals, crooks are using legal weapons from other states illegally here at home. In this video, members of Brooklyn's notorious Blixky gang flash guns and stacks of money. In this one, gang members with street names like Sour, Sosa, and Chrissy Leet repeatedly point at least eight handguns and a rifle at the camera in a show of force meant to intimidate. But according to NYPD investigators, members of the gang reportedly do far more than intimidate. They're a bad crew. People have been arrested in their crew for shootings, robberies. Uh, I think they have some homicides on that are about. So it will probably come as no surprise that many of the guns in the video are here in New York illegally. Several gang members were indicted last August on charges relating to interstate gun trafficking using straw purchasers, someone who buys a gun for someone who can't pass a background check, to buy guns in Georgia and bring them to New York City. Gang members reportedly kept some of the guns for themselves and sold others to make a quick profit. You can buy a cheap 9mm for $300. They can turn around and sell that up here for anywhere from $800 to $2,000. According to a federal indictment, the gang also took special orders and used street lingo they thought would fool the cops. They sometimes referred to firearms using the names of famous athletes, in some instances using jersey numbers as a reference to a caliber or model of firearm, such as using the name Rondo, the last name of Ray Jean Rondo, an NBA basketball player who has traditionally worn jersey number nine to refer to a nine millimeter caliber firearm. On November 3rd, 2020, for example, there was an order for a rondo with free throws, a 9mm firearm with ammunition. All told, the gun runners were charged with getting straw purchases to buy guns in small Georgia towns like Smyrna, Gainesville, Lilburn, and Lawrenceville. They bought 87 guns and brought them to New York City officials charged. So far, 31 have been recovered at crime scenes here. But what's stunning is how quickly they are used to create violence, what the cops call time to crime. So what was the average time that a gun from the time we purchased it to the time uh, it came to New York? Uh, the shortest, I believe, was a day, but that was intercepted down south. And the longest was uh, beginning of the month when it was recovered. It was 549 days. So they're still being recovered. Remember what he's talking about is the time it takes for a gun purchased legally in the South, brought here illegally, then it's confiscated by cops at a crime scene. For example, a 22 caliber Taurus bought in Lawrenceville, Georgia on September 6, 2020, was used to fire three shots at Bronx cops on February 21, 2021. Time elapsed five months, 15 days. A 9mm bought in Smyrna, Georgia on October 26, 2020, was seized by cops on January 6, 2021. Time elapsed two months, 11 days. Police point out that these guns can be used repeatedly even before they're confiscated. That's the the unknown, right? You don't know exactly what is going to happen when these guns hit the streets in New York. Um, obviously, they are being used daily in shootings and different uh, robberies and stuff like that. Even more troubling, police say, is that with the combination of the iron pipeline, guns from southern states in Pennsylvania, and the plastic pipeline, ghost guns, the so called time to crime is getting shorter and shorter. They can come up here within days. And when it comes to how New Yorkers feel, the numbers speak for themselves. 70% say they feel less safe now than they did before the start of the pandemic. That's according to Siena College poll. And our data analysts have been crunching the numbers. The research suggests a link between gun violence and poor blighted neighborhoods. We track shooting victims since 2015, and this map shows a neighborhood breakdown. The darker the color, the more shootings. Bed-Stuy has the most, according to the NYPD. And now take a look at a map showing 311 reports of vacant and abandoned buildings. Side by side, the similarities are clear. Once again, Bed-Stuy has the most. Many argue the most effective way to cut down crime is to stop it before it even happens. And the answers on how to do that might lie with the people who've been personally there before. Marsha Kramer had an eye-opening conversation with a former gang member. Just eight months out of prison, he explains the positive difference that he's now trying to have on the community. And he is doing it with the help of the man 
and tapped by the city to take back our streets. He walked out of the offices of Man Up, a Brooklyn social services group founded by Andre T. Mitchell nearly two decades ago after an eight-year-old was slain by a stray bullet as he walked home from his East New York school. But now Brother Mitchell, as many in the community call him, is New York City's official gun violence prevention czar, hoping to take the lessons he's learned on the streets of East New York to every community torn apart by gun violence. What are you looking to do? Tell me what, what it is. What's your mission? My mission, actually, while I'm walking the streets, is to be a beacon of hope. I'm a credible messenger. I do a lot of interruption of a lot of the violence, yes. So what do you say to people? Like when you come up to somebody in the community that you know might have a weapon? We try to immediately talk them down, say it's not worth it. Whatever that is that they're involved in, we try to really get them to calm down their emotions. They're very emotional. And so they may be angry and they might be above, you know, they're hyper, they're hyperactive. So my goal is to talk people down and bring them back to their senses so that they can rationalize and think about actually what is going on. A lot of times they're, they're forced through the pressure, the pressure of what's going on in the area. They want to get into it because they may want to feel safe. They may want to be a part of something. They don't want, they want to have a sense of belonging and being in a family, so to speak. They may have need of housing. Like that's why sometimes people don't realize these gang members and others are providing things for these young people that we as a society has not. So what are they providing? Hey, family, what's up, y'all? Mr. Mitchell. What's good, brother? How you doing? I'm good. Good to see you. So what do some of these gangs provide that they're not getting at home? They provide sometimes a, a, a wage. You know, they may provide them with some income. You know, they provide them with food. These are basic needs that people are trying to meet. They come out here and they try to get these things on their own, yeah, yeah. and no one's there to provide them. They don't see a ways of being able to get it. And someone else is offering it to them, but it's in exchange for illegal activity or, you know, some wrongdoing. They're going to take it. So they're, they're joining these crews because? Because there's no other alternative. They have no other place to go. If people join a crew or a gang because they're going to get food or work or respect, what can you offer them that keep them from joining those crews and from coming in, in off the street? We can offer them food and housing and a job, right? The same thing that others are offering them to do wrong, we should offer them to do good. That's why Mitchell took me to an $11 million community center built in the neighborhood. It provides things like basketball courts, training programs, even counseling for men and how to be good fathers. Mitchell says centers like this and these athletic fields and basketball courts in East New York should be built in other violence-torn communities. This is an example of how things can turn around, literally. We're not talking rocket science, and we're not talking a lot of money either. You know, we're just talking about the political will. And as we walked the streets where Andre Mitchell and his six brothers and sisters were raised by a single mom, he told me that he too was once a member of a gang. When you grow up out here in these developments here, you know, you kind of join groups that are come from this area. And you have weapons? This, yeah, we have weapons. I've been shot before, I'm not sure. You were shot? I, I've been shot before. Yes, I've been shot. I've been jailed. You know, Tell me about it. Where were you shot? I shot my leg. Because? Yes. Well, because we had rivals. It was like we had we had feuds. Did myself. you ever shoot your gun yourself? No, absolutely not. And that's the thing. Like, no, I never knifed anybody either. But that gave you an ability to understand what's going on in I the do. street. I do understand exactly what's going on. I've had guns in my face. I know what it feels like. I know what it looks like um, to fear for your life. Which is why Mitchell makes it a point to hire others who have been gang members to work for him as violence interrupters. This young man here, just recently came home, is that correct? September. L literally, last September, he just came home from prison, you know? And he served, what? Five years. Five years in prison. For doing what? For guns. Right, for guns. And so, what was the appeal of that life? And then what made you change your mind to come, in, to come into this group? I was pretending to be something that I wasn't for acceptance for a long time. Um, I didn't have the proper resources in my neighborhood. That played a huge role. So not being able to find um, 
employment with good wages and things like that, you kind of turn to the street. At the time, yeah, there was a degree of respect there, um, camaraderie, you know, that sort of thing. Putting together uh, bad ideas for, for money, selling drugs, gunslinging, that sort of thing. Did you ever shoot anyone? How did you feel about it? Like when I was doing it? Um, I felt obligated. Obligated to shoot? I feel obligated to uphold the reputation. I feel obligated to um, uphold the persona, the persona that I built to fit in. I was afraid to disassociate myself from that because then I would lose everything that came with it. And what? to change your mind. I realized that a lot of the things that I believe were false. So I had to um, unlearn some things. I had to do a lot of uh, self-inventory. Um, and once I started still new beliefs, I think that the behavior is kind of followed. Well, when gun violence happens, doctors are right there seeing firsthand the devastating physical impact it has on victims and the emotional toll that follows for families, oftentimes right there in the emergency room. At Northwell Health on Long Island, they offer peer mentors, mental health support, and street outreach. Parents travel across the country talking about their lost loved ones and trying to find solutions. Sinead Johnson's son, Kedrick, was struck and killed by flying bullets at a graduation party in Queens in 2010. And he had an honorary diploma, academic scholarship to St. John's University. I was devastated. I had to do something. Three members of Johnson's family were killed by illegal guns. She tells us she is determined to improve the situation for her three surviving sons. Outreach from doctors stretches far beyond the emergency room. Kevin Rincon spoke with an ER pediatrician at Jacoby Medical Center about the troubling trend of gun violence affecting kids and the hospital initiative that is reducing the number of victims being rushed through its doors. And I think the hardest news you can ever give a mother or father is that their son or daughter has been killed. So far this year, more than 80 kids have been shot and four killed throughout New York City. Since the spring of 2020, the peak of the COVID pandemic, Jacoby Medical Center has seen an increase of 181% when it comes to gunshot victims, among them the most innocent New Yorkers. Anytime a child is injured, I think it truly changes the dynamic of how uh, we view that patient. For Dr. Noe Romo, an emergency room pediatrician, his young patients often don't even understand what's going on. A lot of times they think it was firecrackers um, that were hit. A lot of times parents may not necessarily want to explain exactly what happened and maybe say it was something else that hit them or some other kind of injury uh, because it is quite traumatic. Here in the Bronx, there are more gunshot victims this year than anywhere else in the city. And in the same way the doctors here inside prescribe medicine to the sick, they have tried to find cures for some of the ailments to the gun violence that's been plaguing the community. We like to think that violent trauma is a disease just like any other disease that requires a unique, uh, comprehensive approach that is different from perhaps what we had been doing prior. So rather than just treat a patient who comes in for a gunshot wound, they go a step further. They go into the community to figure out why it happened in the first place. If I don't prevent a patient from coming back from the same injury again, then I haven't quite completed my job. We have all lost somebody that we know to gun violence. That feeling of needing to do something is what helped launch the Stand Up to Violence initiative. It's just one of 69 hospital-based violence interrupter programs nationwide. In our eight years of existence, um, the SUV program has decreased the incidence of gunshot wounds by 55% in the areas that we are in compared to the surrounding precinct areas that, that we are not in. He says the numbers are a sign the program works. They use community outreach workers to go into the streets with the goal of preventing even more violence. Figure out what conflict may have led to their injury and then try to mediate that dispute to prevent both retaliation and re-injury. It's not easy. It takes time. It takes buy-in. But he says if it helps bring the cycle, it's worth it. No matter how bad the situation may be, we are still in a better position than the patients who are in front of us. We are still asked to, to do a duty and serve, and we are doing so. As we've seen, kids of all ages have been caught in the crossfire, finding themselves in unfortunate situations on city streets. Andrea Klein-Thomas visited a charter school in Brooklyn and had a candid conversation with students about the impact it has on their lives. 
My name is Rodney Cofield. I'm in the seventh grade. My name is Kazania, and I'm in the eighth grade. My name is LaVon Wilker, and I'm in the seventh grade. We are talking about gun violence today. So how do you feel? So every time I hear, like, any one of my loved ones has passed away due to gun violence or they've been involved with something related to gun violence, it scares me a little. And especially when one of them has passed away, it, it put a lot of pain in my heart, and it took me a long time to get over. Has that happened to you before? How do you even begin to process that? First, it's like, I couldn't believe it happened, like grief. You start to forget about it after a while and get over it because the person's not with you anymore. Why do you think it's happening so much? Fear, my opinion. I just think it's fear. Everyone's afraid, so they just try to find ways to protect themselves. I think it's revenge. Like, say if like a loved one died, they like they want to like shoot, like shoot at the other person, and then like it's like a cycle and keeps going on and on. Some people have like health problems and mental problems. If something, if life isn't going their way, they use violence as an answer to like get over what happened to them. Especially around like minorities or black communities, if you like struggle with mental health, it's more like. It's more, it always makes it seem as if it's your own fault or that you're just weak if you have it, and it's really not like that. And that it makes it harder for people to get the proper health they need. Anything else you think that people need? Rehab. For what specifically? If they're suffering from guilt or not, they still would need rehab because rehab helps you like get over a lot of things and heal from what you've done and from your past. A lot of times when we talk about shooters, we say, they need to go to jail, put them away. Tell me why you were talking about rehab for them. Because all jail really does for you is like toughen you up even more. My name is Shamika Kenlock. I am the transitioning principal um, at Launch Charter School. I've lost several friends to gun violence, um, childhood friends. Um, eventually my cousin. And then um, two years ago, Saturday will make two years, I actually lost my brother to gun violence. How do you, in a school setting, you have gun violence, you have the pandemic, mm -hmm. you, you have a lot going on. How do you even broach this topic? Kids were coming up and saying they feel unsafe coming to school or there's a lot of violence. And it's been a lot of just like listening to them. Sometimes not even like responding, just listening to what they have to say and their feelings and affirming their feelings. What would you say gun violence is doing to our children? Right now um, is desensitizing children to um, life, right? I think a lot of times a lot of our kids hear it. They, they hear it and it's like, okay, just another person that shot, just another person. And so thinking about life and not seeing how precious life is. What are your fears about where we are right now? My fear is it actually happening to any of my students um, and not wanting to feel that loss. Um, my fears is it happening to anybody else in my family. What do you think like the conversations need to be with, with people from your age to kind of maybe so people won't make that decision when they're getting older. Learning about proper gun safety, what you, what you should do if you find a gun, or you should do if someone else has a gun if they bring it somewhere when they're not supposed to. Tell me what gives you hope and why you think this can be prevented. I think if our community like just comes together and like be peaceful, I think, I think it could be prevented and no one has to get hurt or die so young to be having this conversation, mm -hmm. so striking, right? The hope is here. If we all work together, maybe we can reverse the trend. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Maurice Dubois. And I'm Christine Johnson. If you missed any portion of the special or want more information on your neighborhood or even the programs that we talked about tonight, go to CBSNewYork.com. Have a good evening.